Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, to today's video where I have an executive coach to talk to us about how to find efficiently and effectively remote work in a world that is largely becoming not so remote work friendly. And we will definitely dive into that. So I have with here my esteemed guest and good friend, Aaron. Aaron, how you doing? Doing great, Jaron. How are you, man? I'm doing well. And actually, Aaron was one of my first guests on my channel for those who are OGs and have been around for a while. So uh, it'll, it'll be nice catching up with him. So um, Aaron, before we get into it, maybe just tell people um, who you are, where you're at, what you do, and how you could be of service to the fine folks of Gringo Guides, Men of Now, and uh, for those if they sync to your channel that are looking for remote work. Sure. So I'm an executive coach. And I say executive because we're all the CEO of our lives. And one of the most critical aspects of being a CEO of anything is the ability to manage difficult conversations. So as an executive coach, I help people manage tough conversations in their lives, relationships, and careers. And on the career aspect, one of my specialties is salary negotiation, uh, interviewing well, just to get the offer. And so I know we're talking about kind of more of that top of funnel, how to get the job in a remote sense. Uh, managing all those conversations is something I really pride myself on and enjoy doing, which is why I left corporate America several years ago to be a coach full time and leverage my skill set and experience, having five different careers working across Fortune 500, marquee tech companies, and small business to help you win. All right, perfect. Yeah, and we'll we'll definitely get into some more information here in the conversation. I was thinking earlier in the pre-calls, like you know what, I might need an executive career coach too. So uh, so we'll, yeah. we'll we'll have to we'll have you pitch and plug all your stuff at the end here. I've got stuff to sell too, but let's dive into the meat and potatoes of the topic. So. From your perspective, what trends are you noticing in terms of just remote work in general? Yeah, we saw in the wake of what happened in 2020 explode the, you know, the, the permission to be remote. And then now in the last 12 months, you start to hear all the large technology companies uh, and the large Fortune 500 start to do the saber rattling of it's time to come back to office. So much so that it even has its own acronym, RTO, return to office. Oh. And you're starting to see in job postings, things like that, that this is a hybrid role. So that's the kind of language you're starting to see. And there really is kind of a why in the road forming. Companies that say you need to be in the office, either partially, those are the hybrid roles, or in absolution. I just had a job offer negotiation client today accept an offer at a Series D startup in the Bay, and they're five days a week in office. So just like the old days, right? Um, the other yeah, why in yeah. the road, though, is companies that are saying, no, we're still remote first. And they kind of pride themselves, their culture, uh, and they're kind of the, the employee benefit, the employee experience on the fact that you get to be remote. So I, I'd say there's going to be a continue, continued bifurcation. All the big companies that want people to come back in the office, they're going to go from three to five days, in my estimation, uh, over the next year or two, and really just try and bring people in. Uh, and then the companies that say, we're remote first. They'll use that as a differentiator to, to recruit talent. I've noticed that too. I've been on a job search recently. I mentioned the pre-show. I, I I almost had a scare. So I'm starting with a new client on Monday and they said, hey, can we push it back 90 days? I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. And they just clarified, no, no, no. Can we just put it, push it back another week? Because I'm actually going to the States here this week to meet in person, start getting onboarding stuff, pick up my laptop and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, I'm still going to be there. Like, do you need me to come in? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, 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 we messed up. It's, it's actually... Uh, this month that we want you to start, not not three months out. I'm like, who? But I have noticed on the job search one because um, I live remotely full time. I live in Mexico City, so a lot of companies I've seen that they're more hesitant for those types of things. I lead the conversation with that with the initial phone screen with the recruiter that hey, I live in Mexico City. Um, everything is paid through my home state, and I've never had any issues. I've only had issues with one company in my career with that. But I always lead with that to make sure that we don't waste our time going through the interview cycle and have that issue come up. Um, I've also noticed, like you said, a lot of newer, usually earlier stage tech type startups. And I think it's because of just a, a, an expense type thing that they do pride themselves on the remote first type thing. They're a little more flexible. But I've noticed that the salaries for remote positions seem like they're a bit suppressed as compared to years past when at, when there was just jobs abundant in the market. I remember in 2021, I think about this time that year, I started a job search on Monday and by Friday I had two full-time offers and it was, it was actually quite nice. So yeah. can you comment on how is the demand for remote positions or just work in general evolved in these recent years? Yeah, it's a great question. And so yeah, there's two layers to that and you kind of touched on both, which is the, just the macro economic employment picture from 2020, especially 2021, 
you know, with the stock market ripping and uh, job offers and job placement going to really what was kind of a parabolic high. And then, you know, Facebook was kind of the one that popped the bubble of tech, uh, the tech bubble on unemployment by doing their first layoff. And what was it, you know, first quarter of 2022. So that was the beginning of what we're seeing now, which is more company layoffs um, and just shedding workforce. And then companies have been really slow and very intentional about bringing people on board. So basically it's the macroeconomic picture is jobs are harder to find and harder to get, but they're not impossible. You know, companies are still growing. There's still innovation out there and there's still opportunities for you. It's just going to mean that will you get two offers in two days uh, after starting a company, uh, starting one job, it's, you know, m not going to be as likely, but nothing's impossible. And then the second layer is on the, the fact that remote work, you know, some companies, like I said, depends on their philosophy. Uh, the big companies want people to come back in the office, as we said. And, you know, as a former compensation consultant uh, for these big companies, the whole lens is geography based pay. So if you're, um, you know, in California looking for jobs and in 2020, you bounced to Georgia because you want some country living. Now the companies are starting to say, hey, if you're going to remain there, then we're going to pay you to a localized salary uh, based on that market data. And so the remote job is partially driven by where you are. And when when you said, hey, these remote jobs seem to be they're paid less. Um, now, you could be at a New York or a, excuse me, at a San Francisco company and decide to move to New York and you're still technically remote, but you may not take as much of a hit because New York is just as a competitive a geography from a compensation standpoint as San Francisco. In fact, those are the top two cities in the entire United States. Every other city is below them from a compensation geography philosophy. So you just have to understand where you're at and then where your company's uh, localized nexus is from their compensation philosophy, where that headquarters is uh, in determining, is this going to impact me? So one anecdote is Spotify in the wake of all the remote work happening in 2021 and 2022 said, we're going to pay all of our employees who are remote, basically everyone in the company, the same as if they were in San Francisco. That's pretty cool for an employee. It's expensive for a company. And m a lot of companies probably won't do that just to be you know, realistic about it. But there are companies that do have certain distinct compensation philosophies. So those are the ones you wanna target if you're gonna be a remote employee so that you can get maximize your earnings and also minimize your expenses based on where you live or at least enjoy the lifestyle that you want. I think that's a, that's a great point. And I know that in my most recent job search, there's some lessons learned along the way because the market conditions have changed over the last couple of years. One, I actually had a recruiter request or suggest to me that um, I'm from Eastern Washington State. Everything gets paid through Washington State. We have no income tax there, although I live abroad, which is nice. We also get the federal earned income exemption down here. So that's nice, too, to take advantage of that geo financial arbitrage aspect. But I had a recruiter tell me, um, put Seattle on your resume so that Washington based recruiters that can actually hire remote workers in Washington State will reach out to you. And then again, on that initial phone screen, I just tell them, hey, I'm actually from Eastern Washington State. I do get some hybrid positions, do on-site positions. Hey, I'm actually from Eastern Washington State. That'd be a three and a half, four hour drive. So I, I can't quite swing that. However, would you be open to remote? And then, oh, by the way, I actually live in Mexico most of the year. Is that going to be an issue? And I found that most of the time it's not. I think is if they've already piqued their interest, some of them are just flat out no. Um, I have friends down here, other foreigners in Mexico City that have worked that formerly worked for fang companies. And mm -hmm. what I've seen happen, and I've heard from them, a lot of the fang companies let them go, and then they repost the same position on site for 33 to 50% lower salary and require it to be on site. So I've gotten calls from fang companies. Hey, do you want to live in this high rent district and make 50% of what this job was paying to remote workers a year ago? I'm like, uh, I'd be poor at, at that rate. I'd be no, that's not even feasible. How how could you offer that rate in this high rent district in these major West Coast metros? I don't quite get it. And again, I've never, I've never worked for a fang company directly. I've consulted for some, but I have friends here that were full-time fang employees and I've heard it from multiple people that that's really not the case anymore. So it's so for those thinking of living abroad, you know, take these things into consideration. But for people already living abroad, it's like, all right, well, I'm down here. I'm legal. Like I live right. in Mexico full-time. What do you what do you do in that case? Luckily, I figured it out. I look at a job search just like a marketing and sales funnel. So you have to make adjustments along the way to 
uh, increase leads moving through your funnel or streamlining that uh, selling or that conversion journey. So my next question for you would be, what advice do you have for job seekers looking to land remote positions in today's market? Yeah, I mean, segueing off what you said, I mean, it is a marketing exercise. And so being able to select your ideal customer avatars, your target companies, and then also ensure that you have the right value proposition your copy is optimized, your customer journey is optimized, as in your resume, your interview skills, uh, and your ability to convey the value that you have uh, during an interview process. Obviously, remote or not, that's table stakes. Um, but I would say targeting the companies is going to be your biggest advantage, just because, you, like you said, you want to paint yourself into a corner. Say, hey, we really like you. We think you'd be a great fit, but you need to be in an office. That's not something you want to find out at the end of the in interview process. Um, the slight twist there though, is if a company is open to it, but maybe they seem not hundred percent open, like you think that they don't actually really mean that this role is going to be remote. If you interview well and can build leverage, uh, by interviewing well, and they're like, you know, we'll be willing to make an exception for you. There is that sort of narrow, um, uh, you know, kind of in between companies that are, Hey, we are distinctly remote versus like, no, you have to be in office now, obviously all of your viewers may not fall into that category where they have uh, the ability or the skill set at this current juncture to have so much leverage that they can ask for something like that. But it's worth taking a shot no matter what you're doing and who you are, because eventually you don't know. You want to say no for other people. I think that's kind of a, a classic life advocacy thing, even in, also in salary negotiations, things like that. Saying no to four other people is you negotiating against yourself. So you can start take that shot. And if people are not giving you uh, what you want, then there may be an invitation for you to increase your skill sets, learn a more premium skill set to be able to contribute more value. Um, of course, then there's the focus on companies that definitely are remote, so you don't have to climb that uphill battle. Uh, so that's kind of the, the general premise on company selection. Then, of course, are your skills um, even able to be used in a remote environment? Uh, sometimes there are certain things in manufacturing, so on and so forth, that you got to be on site. So you're know, making sure that you're able to switch into a skill set that will be able uh, to translate into a remote environment is going to be really important. And lastly, um, you know, interviewing well is good, but be able to articulate how your current skill set, sure, it may be able to be done over Zoom, but that you are well versed in operating in a remote or distributed environment, a distributed yep. network. A lot of them ask about that. I've been interviewing quite a bit these last few months. They want to know, have you already done it? Are you set up? Uh, like, mm -hmm. how do you manage line of communication, different time zones, all of those things? 100%. And, you know, and how do you get work done asynchronously, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So being able to speak well-versed in that regard and communicate that you've, like you said, done it is going to be a huge differentiator. Yeah. And I think to piggyback on a couple of your points, because I I've never had issues getting jobs in my career. Usually I'm recruited out of positions and then I've just had a slow progression in my career. So this time around, I just scratched my head. Like I'm not getting offers within one week of being on the market. Uh, <laughs> let's, you know, I was kind of spoiled in the past, but it also let me know that maybe it's not a me thing. Maybe it's more of a, a changing market conditions thing, which we right. addressed uh, just a couple minutes ago. So a couple of best practices I learned um, as, as using putting your marketing cap on that I was doing the spray and pray thing before that wasn't working out at all, just blasting out resume, same generalist type resume. So then I went through and I do this just, I'm a marketer by trade in my marketing experience. You look at what your ideal customer is, like how easy is it to land the customer, how good of a customer they are. Um, what's that, what's their average uh, lifetime value of the customer LTV and really who do you want to work with? So I went backwards in my career and so like, what were the jobs I really liked that I really enjoyed that were easy, but that were fun and that where I could grow and where I made good money. And I didn't, you identified a couple of verticals from my past and then I went through and started looking at job postings because sometimes the, the the actual titles will change. But I started setting those filters, looking, okay, I like companies about this size, the com companies with this annual uh, recurring revenue, companies that are in this stage, um, companies where it's this type of culture, it's from this time zone or based in this city and what have you. And then I, and then I identified a handful of job titles, went through, found the ideal job titles, plugged it into chat. GPT made an avatar and then took my generalist resume and then had, had it expand on, upon it and then dial it down to write targeted resumes for these specific job company type 
industry avatars. And then I noticed that when I did that, rather than sending out hundreds of resumes a week, I was sending out maybe a couple dozen a week, but they were very targeted, very selected. And I spent more time too, in terms of submitting an actual job package. So I do the customized cover letter. Guess what guys, chat GPT will do that for you. Um, I have templates from the past of my career. Same thing, jobs that I landed that paid really well, that were really engaging, that where I really learned a lot and really liked my team. I have all of those cover letters. I have that entire conversion process outlined. So I just plug it into chat GPT. Hey, make it align with my current resume in this position. And it spits it all out for you. Um, and I, and I realized that that was a lot easier to, to do it that way. Um, I know we'll get into some interview and offer type questions here shortly, but, um, that really, really helped me out in terms of starting to streamline things along. So um, the next question, I think it'll segue off of what, what we've been talking about. You mentioned there's transferable skills and qualifications that are particularly valuable for remote type workers. And I get guys that reach out to me all the time like, hey, I am in, as you mentioned, an industrial or manufacturing type role. Or um, I've had guys, hey, I'm a small business owner. I'm doing very well, but it requires me to be on site. How, how, how do I segue into the remote work type thing? So for people that um, I've got a guy that just signed up for our private group today, uh, asking, Hey, I'm kind of new to the job market. I'd be entry level with whatever I do, but like, what do I need to start learning? What certifications do I need? What kind of skills or qualifications should I develop? Or should I highlight my job search journey that are valuable for remote roles to where I can get the leg up on that competition? Yeah. So the question is, how do you choose credentials and education yep. to skills, right qualifications, uh, and particularly sp uh, specific industries as well for remote sure. roles? I mean, look, I would say no matter what industry is, you should have some level of interest in it. Um, that's maybe above average. And I'm not saying it must be your passion. It's helpful if it is, but you know, obviously there are certain areas where you need, sometimes you need to do what you need to do so that you can do what you want later. But having a semblance of passion and interest is going to be a key differentiator for you and the employer is going to notice it. Uh, so it's also going to help you move through the tough times uh, when there's hard work, you know, you have to have some grit but it has to be you know, of interest to you for why do you wake up every day to do something? So I just want to check in with your audience there and say, make sure you have some semblance of passion for what you're going to get educated in. So really it's like from there, if you have passion, then choose what is the most premium skill set to earn in software engineering, coding, development, things like that. Um, you know, the right in your world, the niche, the niches and nuance of what's the premium skill sets in marketing and digital marketing is a copywriting, mm -hmm you know, coming up and being a, a growth hacker, those types of things. A lot of it's AI. So yeah. in my time off the market, I've been learning AI tools, building workflows and processes. And then um, in my last little little rant, uh, I've noticed that I've created, a, I have a portfolio too. So, hey, how quickly can you do AI? Like, can you do AI video? Can you do AI emails? So before, a couple of years ago, that was looked down upon. It's like, you're cheating if you use AI, but the smart companies, again, especially these early stage type startups, they're building entire companies around AI optimization, generative video AI, AI targeted marketing. So I already have all this stuff. So now we're, before I had to hide it, I'm like, hey, you know what? I have a Loom account with all of these videos of me showing exactly how to optimize these AI workflows. I'm your guy. So mm -hmm. that started helping me out too. Um, and I've done that my whole career. In the early 2000s, I knew everything was going digital. When, when Facebook came out, I believe it was 2007, I knew that social media marketing was something I had to learn before companies around 2012 timeframe started getting on that bandwagon. I knew that the world was going to go remote long before 2020 and started mm -hmm. positioning my to work remote first 10 years ahead of the time. So I'd recommend um, just from general, whatever you're doing in your career, make sure there's a market for it now, not only now, but in the future, where, where is the market going and make sure that you're upskilled and ready to meet the market when it gets there. And that, I've done that my whole career and it's worked out fairly well for me. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, having that long-term view and being able to make the move when it's not so comfortable now, but setting yourself up for that success in the future. Yeah. Just like standing. buying Bitcoin on day one and not waiting for it to hit the mass media hype. <laughs> yeah, which totally. I wish I would have done that. I didn't do I that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I see the other thing is those are great things that you said, Jaron. And also building a personal brand um, is, is can never hurt. You know, do you necessarily need to? I know there's all sorts of talk online about these faceless Instagram and YouTube accounts that make a ton of money. Um, I'm sure that anything is possible, right? But having being a known quantity, at least in your vertical, you know, if you are, hey, I put together AI workflows for small businesses or marketing agencies, you know, having that niche uh, brand awareness is going to be very beneficial for you. 
And mm-hmm. yeah, I think the, the irony is when you start to build yourself up to get a job remotely, you're almost like one move away from being an entrepreneur, uh, or at mm-hmm. least a solo entrepreneur and being a, or at least a robustly, play, robustly paid consultant or contractor. So kind of the, you know, when you swing a ball, baseball bat or golf club, we all know you got to swing through uh, for mm-hmm. that to be the most effective uh, move. And it's basically doing that with your career. You may swing through a job and find yourself building a successful business. I found myself doing that too. Again, a lot of these companies doing pushback. Hey, uh, you know, you live in Mexico full time. We don't know if we can necessarily do that. And I was like, Hey, it's actually a benefit to you. You know, the same salary band you have as a W2 position, just 1099 me. You don't have to pay all of your expenses on your end. I don't need benefits. I don't need 401k. I don't need health, vision, dental. I don't need life insurance. I'm abroad full time. So in that sense that just bring me on as an individual contractor. And then I'm also, uh, I don't like doing this, but I'm also able to accept lower rates too, because I have the tax benefit of the foreign income, uh, foreign earned income exemption. So really what I focus on, I don't focus on my growth so much as on my net. So I can take lower positions, but I'm still netting way more than I did when I lived in California full time at much higher salary ranges. And then I have flexibility. I have my lifestyle. I get to be my own boss. So these are little mental changes I made too, like, okay, yeah, on the offer, the, it's not as high as I would like to be making, but my, my take home is way, pi- way higher. My expenses are a fraction of what they were in the U S. So at the end of the day, I'm actually getting ahead for a lot less, which was, it's kind of my philosophy in general, like when it comes to like fitness or dating or any of that kind of stuff, just what's the minimally viable effective dose. And I've yeah. started applying that model to my career and my business in general. And it seemed to, to help out well. Um, now in terms of I know a lot of things are going virtual these days. There's still kind of that pushback from some companies, but I think eventually it will swing more into the remote type thing. Um, can you share insights into how the hiring process has adapted to virtual environments? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, really it's still multiple interview rounds, just as if you were in person. If a company wants to do four rounds or eight rounds, they're going to do it. It's just done over Zoom. Um, and sometimes it's a whole panel still on Zoom. But in short, yeah. And I, I, back my last tour of duty in corporate America was uh, the final interview was a a big panel interview where I had to present uh, a project that I had done. And I like stuff like that, but I I like panel interviews because I can work the whole audience. And then you, you, there's always that one person that really likes you, which is good. Mm -hmm. You get, you do the small talk, get that person on board, but then you you try to find the detractor too and make sure that, Hey Kelly, I noticed you've been kind of quiet over there. You just taking notes or is there something specifically that I failed to cover as it impacts potentially your department or what, when, what degree would we be working together? I want to make sure that you really understand, you know, what value I can add to your team. Although we might not necessarily be direct downline or upline reports, or you might not even be on my team, but I want to make sure that I'm covering, you know, what it is you're looking for too. And I, I like, I like working a group more than one person. Cause sometimes you get that stickler of a person. You're like, Oh God, I have an hour left of this guy. And I don't think he's buying it or I don't think he's feeling me. Yeah. Well, that's a dynamite question. And a really good thing, you know, to call out, you know, cause like calling out things like that during an interview, one of my favorite interview questions that I ask, you know, that the, the candidate should ask that I end with is, you know, from everything you've seen about my candidacy and my resume and interview performance today, is there any reason why you would have to not hire me? I do that too. And then it's really, I know that you, you have much more of a background on this, but like on the candidate side, when I got that suggestion years ago, it's like, it's kind of ballsy at first. You're like, Oh, yeah. like I can't ask that. Now I always ask that because yeah. I track like, again, just like marketing and sales, I track all of my, my interviews, the companies I'm, I'm potentially uh, going through the process with in a spreadsheet. And I want to know like, what's the likelihood of this one coming through. Um, usually I ask them too, like, Hey, is there anything I failed to present or anything that left you scratching your head or where, where I need to provide more clarity while you have me face to face, I'd like to clear it up now. And the answer is usually no. And sometimes they will be the, the candidate like, Hey, you know, I, I, I understand the job description really emphasize these areas as it's written. And you're correctly giving interview responses based on what the requisition requires, but actually it's come up that we need some more we need some skill set in this area too can you comment on that and Mm -hmm. for me we're on interview number five we haven't even touched on that because it's not in the requisition like yeah you know what i'll I'll gladly do that let's let you know let's go let's go ahead and uh and dive into that and then the follow-up your question uh, again marketing sales hat on is uh ask for the job for me like it took me forever in my career to get to the point like just ask for the job like is there any reason why you wouldn't hire me today all right cool like when do we start what do you need from me what are the next steps i'm ready to go you know, let's, yeah. let, let's do it. And well, a lot of times, and a lot of times, you know, you'll get off, you'll get off the interview and then the recruiter will call right back. Like, Hey, they love you. Like, 
<laughs> you know, we'll put together an offer, you know, they'll do the verbal offer and then send you the written one. But, uh, but again, that's something I just brought into my job search, uh, best practices a couple of years ago. You know, I wish I would have been doing that earlier in my career. It's a really good point. I think the point should be emphasized even for people who are interviewing for roles where sales and deal making aren't part of it, you know, administrative functions, maybe you work in IT or something or finance, HR, these types of things where that isn't necessarily expected. Uh, definitely a good thing to do because to show that you're a go getter uh, and you're you know interested in the role and that you can you can complete a conversation and advocate on your behalf, because how can you advocate on the company's behalf if you can't do it for yourself? I think that's a fantastic point. And especially I, I work in marketing and sometimes I'll dip my toes into sales more on the sales enablement side. But for me, I think if I were hiring for marketing or salesperson, I want someone who can close the deal. If you can't close me, how do I expect you to close these prospects that are coming through our funnels? Like that's, that, that wouldn't work for me as a hiring manager. For sure. And I think it's some people have a perception of, you know, like you said, you, it was a kind of ballsy thing to say when you first heard it, but now it's a commonplace thing. And that transition from, oh, I don't know if it's a little tough for me to be doing that versus I'm not going to be passive. Having a forward lean is is a good thing, not a bad thing. I think most people have a point in their career in their life where they realize that they can step forward and it's OK. I've also noticed, too, I did this in my recent job search. Um, at first, I'd say it was artificial, just introducing the artificial sense of urgency. And then in doing so, after a week or two, it became a real sense of urgency. And they'll ask you, um, hey, wh wh where are you in your job search phase? And uh, first, like, hey, I'm in the initial stages. I'm doing phone screens. Uh, then it was, hey, I'm uh, uh, hey, I'm in a couple different stages. I'm in the offer stage for some, kind of middle stage for others, still early stage for others. And then it got to the point where I just started saying something along the lines of, hey, you know what? I'm actually fast. I'm actually quickly appro approaching the offer stage. I'm still getting recruiters reached out and there's a lot of activity on my end. You're definitely one of the top companies I'd talk into and I'd hate for you to miss on the opportunity. I'm really interested in moving forward, but but we need to go quickly. And I'm at a point where I want companies that are serious. I want to work for someone who wants me to work for them and vice versa. So if you want me in the mix, let, let's go ahead and move it forward. And again, sounds like a ballsy thing to say, but I started getting things moving instead of two or three months talking to companies. Oh, we'll get back to you in two weeks. Oh, the CEO's on vacation. Oh, we have to wait for this. My my search cycle is condensed to like a week or two, like ten days of like them moving me through, the, them fast tracking me through the interview process. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. I love that. That's great advice. And you know, what size of companies were these, by the way? Uh, so I so I look for two different size companies. I like your more enterprise level, huge international conglomerate companies to where. I earlier in my career, I did not like this to where like, I'm just a cog in the machine to where, okay, I'm just, I'm just a widget maker making widgets. I can log in. I can look at my, uh, workflow management, whatever tool it is for the day, understand what my week looks like. We have minimal meetings. I'm an independent contributor and I can just plug in, chug out work, turn the computer off and then go live my life. Other ones are like the early stage startups where I'm the first marketing hire and I get to build the department out from the ground floor as I right. visualize it. So I like both of those types of companies. Um, I usually say for the early stage, my sweet spot scaling companies and the single digit millions per year up to 100 plus million a year. I've done that twice now in my career within two to three years and they've actually sold for a very, very nice payday for everyone involved. Um, and then throughout my career, I've had those like worldwide huge companies with hundreds of thousands of employees across countries to where, okay, the salary is a little, little higher. The, like maybe the growth opportunity isn't there, but it's something where I can just, again, just log on. I know exactly what the work week looks like. Not going to be that exciting. Not going to, not going to really learn that much outside of work, but I'm, you know, I'm curious. I, I'll upskill on my own outside of work, but it's really just getting in there, getting the work done, getting off, and then living life too. So, so I like to go on usually either sides of those those extremes. The early stage startups are like the well established enterprise level companies. Right. Yep. That's good. Yeah, having a, a philosophy about what's culture when size of company mm -hmm. is going to be good for you is important. Yeah, because the early stage companies they require a much more connectivity, much more. Uh, engagement, much more time online, getting back in a timely manner to like site communications or whatever. Whereas I've worked for large companies to where you just log in and you have you have your task list for the week and then just get it done and you'll do your weekly or bi-weekly sprint review. Maybe maybe you'll do everyday standups. Um, a, a lot of times, a lot of times I've been brought in at the mid-level manager above level. I'll get rid of those. I just hire guys that I trust can get done what needs to be done when it needs to be done, and then I'll manage the. The higher ups in the company and then we all just kind of like you said work asynchronistically and that works really well um 
in teams that I've structured in the past. So I, so I look for opportunities to where I either can get plugged into a culture like that that already exists or I get to create that culture uh, when I build a team underneath me. And that seems to, again, have worked well throughout my career. Awesome. Yeah, creating your own culture is the best. Yeah, right. Um, so in terms of job searches, what platforms or resources do you recommend for effective remote job searches? And then again, piggybacking on the, you know, what kind of company do you want to work for? How do you find them? You know, where do you go to start looking for these companies or these avatars once you have them identified? Sure. And, you know, like there's so many platforms out there that are remote first or remote specific in their job posting. So definitely want to Google those. Um, the thing I want to highlight is looking at companies that say they are remote first, companies like Dropbox or DoorDash, mm -hmm. things like that here in the U.S. Uh, they have a distinct, you know, on their careers page to say, hey, we are remote first as part of our culture and our ethos. Those are great places to start and, you know, apply for jobs at because you know that there isn't a problem with you being uh, remote. And I think it's there's lists out there you can find on Google and maybe chat GPT can tell us now. But you know, what are the top companies that say with a remote first culture? Great place to start. And then obviously companies that aren't on that list, you have to double check. Not every list is fully inclusive, but looking on their careers page to see how they talk about their own roles and their culture is a great place to start. Then of course, what does the job posting itself say? Not every company has and all or nothing. Uh, some companies obviously have some roles that are in office and others that are okay to be remote. Remote for the right candidate. I saw a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so that is, that is an additional challenge because interviewing well, increasing leverage, maybe being able to call your own shots on whether you're in office or not um, is a harder, harder uh, mountain to climb, but it is possible. Yeah. And I've noticed too, even I, I mentioned earlier, these fan companies to where their, their culture, they're going away from remote first and want people on site or maybe hybrid at best. I still have recruiters occasionally reach out for these fan companies and say, Hey, this is actually a remote position. I asked them, well, I thought this wasn't a remote first company. Like, well, no, no, no. You'd be working for our firm. And then we'd subcontract you to the fan company in which case we can do remote first. So I think there's wow. kind of that work around there, which I didn't realize was a thing until, of course, I just pick up phone calls from numbers that, you know, don't say <laughs> scam on it. And uh, yeah, I'm a recruiter so-and-so and, you know, we're actually recruiting for this company. It's like, oh, I didn't, I thought they weren't remote first. Like, well, they're not, but we are. So you'd be con you'd be hired through us and then we'd contract you to them. Like, oh, okay. So didn't realize that was a thing either. Huh. Interesting. I hadn't heard that either. You know, and that's a great way to get some work. And if that works for you, fine. I, mean, I think the important thing to understand, especially in tech, if you're going to be a contractor, it's likely that you're not going to get equity. And so yeah. usually they have you work just like everyone else and, you know, contributing to that mission, working your face off, but not having a you know piece of that asymmetric upside is just something to be aware of. I did that early in my career. I was hired directly by a large defense contractor. And then they put me physically on a project for one of their subcontractors that they subcontracted out. So the subcontractor, they get like nice Christmas bonuses and vacations and gifts. And I was an integral part of the team, but I was hired by the actual parent company that was subbing out the work. So I was never a part of any of that. And it's like, oh, I would have liked to have that Christmas bonus. Nope. Because, you know, the the huge international corporate conglomerate did not did not do that, but the small company that was subbed through the company I was contracted through. Right. Oh yeah, with bonuses all around because we hit our you know we hit our contract milestones. Like oh this sucks. You know I'm a part of the team, but I think it really depends on how you structure these types of agreements. I think at the end of the day, it really is just it's just business and it's all just a series of agreements. Correct, and managing the conversation to change those agreements in your favor. I think that's one of the most important things in terms of you mentioned earlier, be the CEO of your career. And then you have to be on the proactive side rather than the reactive side. And earlier in my career, I used to be like probably a lot of candidates are out there more on the passive side. Like, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just put out a resume and a portfolio and a good cover letter. And then we'll just we'll just see what happens. Whereas now I drive the conversation. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm a hot commodity on the market. There's multiple offers coming through the pipeline and I want to work with you. So if the feeling's mutual let's get it going. You know, let's, let's not drag our feet and waste our time. And I've noticed that that works really well for me. Um, so in that breath, are there any specific keywords or strategies or tactics that can help candidates stand out or get a leg up on the competition when they're going through the remote job search application process, interview process, offer process, or just the overall process? Yeah. I mean, overall it's like that we're distributed, um, you know, asynchronous project management, you know, being able to move across, you know, time zones, things like that. The, and obviously is the role specifically that you're applying for even going to need that? Sometimes if they're remote, it's like, well, this is, um, 
sometimes, you know, HR roles, they're remote and you're going to have to be available to have conversations with, you know, your employee and client groups that maybe are in multiple locations. So that's an important thing to say that you have that ability. Um, but other times it's really just about once your resume is in and you start the phone screen process, finding what the pain points are, the unique pain points of the role, the team and your hiring manager, so that then you can start to articulate how you specifically can solve them uh, is what I like to call when I coach uh, people on rounding up your answers in the interview. So being able to answer the question that wasn't asked uh, is one of the best ways to not only get a job, but to get the role leveled up higher in scope than it was advertised for. And so that's an example of that is like, if they ask you about something, tell me about a time that you did X, Y, and Z. It's like, well, in this last role that I had, I had that problem and here's how I solved it. Then you continue by in the roundup is, and since I saw that problem occur re frequently, in order for it to never happen again, I put this process in place. I trained this team to do X, Y, Z, y and Z so that we could all benefit from the efficiency of solving this problem once and for all. And like, they didn't ask necessarily, but now that you've said it, they're like, oh, interesting. And maybe they can go into more than that and think of you as a higher level candidate. I think that's a good point. I've noticed it in my job searches, uh, successful ones in the past, and even more recently in, I take more of a consultative approach in terms of, okay, like, like, like I looked at the job requirements. I looked at the qualifications. Obviously I meet them. Uh, the resume matches up to a degree to where we're on this conversation. We're talking face to face, but like you said, going that step further, you know, why are you really posting this position? Is it a brand new position? Is it a backfill position? Maybe it's just maternity leave, a short time position. A lot of times, Hey, you know what? We're an early stage startup. We just got some fundraising. We have some successful campaigns recently. We're starting to hit that initial point of our hockey stick growth curve. Great. Like the, that, that changes how I'm going to follow up my question questions based on, um, Hey, we're a large company. We recently went through a, a, a headcount correction, had a large round of layoffs kind of dinged us, you know, from public perception wise, but now we need to right size that we laid off too many people. So I need to bring some of these positions back so that that'll change the entire process and what they're, they're really looking for. So, um, I know it's tough for me, you guys that have followed me for a while. Sometimes I can get long winded, but I like to ask a lot more questions um in terms to understand what is it they're really looking for and then how do you solve this problem and taking it again more from like a sales type approach or a consultative approach absolutely because sometimes interviewers especially at either we'll call it large corporations or maybe even really some, small some places, don't know what they want that's what that's I've noticed. exactly where i'm going they don't yeah. actually know what they want um or they don't especially in like larger companies where like the interview team is people you're not going to be working with working with they're there as a, a bar raiser they're there to check for fit culture fit those types of things is like being able to really connect with them to show like hey do you have a genuine problem or pain point that this role will impact rather than just kind of going through the motions of the interview like they get hr maybe hands them protocol for like this is how you interview a candidate and this is just something they have to do you want to be able to wake them up and shake them out of that sort of wrote memorization let me just get to the next task and be like no this is a great candidate and then i felt engaging conversation with them is something that differentiated them it'll help you a lot yeah i think i think that's absolutely a a, a fantastic point and and again i oh i know i've been in a position before where i've had to write a put out a job requisition to hire for people and then it's out there and then the recruiter or whatever hr starts bringing in resumes um and then there's someone else on the team or maybe an adjacent team like, oh, hey, by the way, we need this, but we don't have enough for a full time posting or, oh, hey, hey, by the way, did he mention that? So even as the interview cycle is changing from the hiring manager standpoint, things change. So that's why uh, going again on the client side, I like to really ask, OK, like what what will this role really entail? What does my day to day look like? You know, who will be who will, will I be interacting with? You know, who do I report to? Who are the the internal or external stakeholders? All of these types of things to really understand what is it going to look like me working with you? And I, I tell them a lot of times at the end of the day, and I've seen this has worked in my career. I don't say this to all of them, but uh, like, hey, I've hired for positions in the past. I know that you get a lot of qualified candidates coming through. But really, at the end of the day, a lot of times it comes down to like, who do I want to spend time working with? Yeah. And sometimes I go into a story. I've worked for a company in Houston and uh, we had to go to a trade show to Portland, Oregon. And my coworker, her stuff was sent to Portland, Maine. And the flight was delayed and it was a bunch of whatever headaches getting in. So we got into Portland, Oregon at like 1 a.m. All the stores were closed at 8.30. We had to be on site for this event and none of our marketing swag came in and our company uniforms or clothes didn't come in. So the only thing we found open was like a 24-hour Rite Aid and we had to like 
put it together. We got some poster boards and markers and all, all they had were like purple, just blank, ugly shirts. And we had bought like some black stupid pants, you know, cause it was like, it was a Rite Aid, but they had some clothes and they had some of this stuff and we just made it work until the luggage and all the marketing stuff, all the event stuff came in from Portland, Maine, which it eventually got in. But on day one, we weren't ready to go. So we had to kind of ad hoc it along the way. And it actually, I think turned out well for us because people are like, where's your shirts? What's going like, huh? Like what's up with your booth? Like, Oh, funny story. turns out there's a Portland, Maine too. And that (laughs) actually got the conversation going. We actually did really well at that event, but that coworker was cool because, um, she was uh, she was African American too. She's like, "Hey, do they have my hair products here?" I'm like, "Oh, a little thing about Portland, Oregon. It's like the least diverse city in the entire U.S. So, whereas in Houston, you get entire aisles dedicated to ethnic hair products. In Portland, Oregon, you do not. So, like, but she was just a real cool coworker. So we we had to we had to just kind of figure it out and ad hoc it. We were just laughing the entire time. So sometimes I'll tell that story and then be like, "Hey, so at the end of the day." are you looking for someone like this can just, just kind of weather the storm and overcome any obstacles and just do it with stride and a grin on their face. And if so, then I'm your guy. Cause I know there's a lot of us who are qualified, but I'm the guy who can do that. And I've seen, I've seen that work for me as well. Again, I don't say it to everyone, but if I see some hesitation, like maybe is this a culture fit? Sometimes it does come down to, yeah, you have the technical background. Yeah. You, you have all the uh, evidence that you can do it. It is, you say you do, but like, is it a culture fit? Sometimes I'll I'll tell that story. And again, at the end of the day, who do you want to be working with? Because there's a lot of qualified candidates out there. And I realize I'm one of the bunch, but tell that little anecdote to set me aside from the competition. I like it. It's a great story, man. And it exudes a great characteristic and trait about you as a candidate when you're looking for a job. Now, what what would you say um, in general, in terms of telling stories or anecdotal things. I know sometimes I'll get long winded. So I usually try to fill out the room. If it isn't on, sometimes I'll have interviews where it's just an ongoing conversation. We don't even touch any of the standard job interview questions. And then, Oh, Hey, I only got five minutes left. I have a hard out. Hey, I have to check these boxes for HR. Just dun, 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 dun. I'm like, all right, let's do rapid fire round. And, but I think I found more like building that chemistry, that connection. I know as a candidate that I'm going to go through rather than if, okay, here's the 10 point checklist. Let's spend two to three minutes on each one. I've, I've noticed that sometimes there's more dry interviews where you don't really have that chemistry won't necessarily get me f- forward in the process as much as like, Hey, Bob, how's it going? Oh, fantastic day. Oh, I see it's sunny out there too. So you're, you're, you're near Arizona. Oh, you golf, you know, th- those kind of, you know, just building the, the rapport thing. And again, I'd take it back to just sales and marketing. So in general, um, Feel free to pine on that point I just made. But in general, how can candidates prepare for remote job interviews to ensure success? I know there's a lot of tips, a lot of do's and don'ts, but just in general, like what's a good starting point for people new to the interviewing process, specifically for remote jobs? It's a great question and great point that you make as well. Uh, you make having that personal connection. So I like a blend. Uh, it's important to be able to talk about the role. And you know, a lot of my candidates or a lot of my clients that I help are candidates for large companies, tech companies, startups. And a lot of these people have either come from, you know, the, if they're working at a startup that the managers at there came from maybe Google, Meta, Amazon. So you know, everyone's got some semblance of pedigree and they they know how it quote unquote should be done. Um, if it's an entrepreneur, maybe a little bit different of a situation, but most people kind of have a kind of a corporate sense and, mm-hmm. As you said earlier, sometimes people are interviewing and they just they don't know what they want. They don't, um, you know, they don't f- didn't have a lot of agency or buy-in into the the interview process as far as constructing candidate selection criteria. So they're just kind of there. And even if they were like, "Hey, I am the hiring manager," and you know, the other people part of this process are, are part of the panel, but I'm the one making the decision. I'm the one articulating what I'm looking for. Being able to be concise is really important. Uh, so that you can get through all of their questions and have room for you to ask questions. Because you asking questions, you're interviewing them as well. It's a two-way street. Yep. You want to know that it's going to be a fit for you, but also uh, asking questions can do two things. Number one, it can reveal good information so that you can understand the full scope of the role uh, or particular pain points that you have an expertise in that you can illuminate and highlight, and then that can become a leverage point later for when it's time to negotiate. Um, but also... Just asking good questions makes you look good, look informed, look interested. Uh, and if you don't have the opportunity to do that because you maybe were too verbose, much like I'm being right now in my answer, 
you know, then you kind of burn into that time, which is your time at the end, because they're going to get through their questions. Yeah. And I've noticed that d different interviewers have different interview styles or just different personality or communication styles. So I had one recently to where I got to the final interview, had to talk to the CEO. And I've noticed too, that a lot of times recruiters, if they like you, they'll, they'll actually root for you and kind of push you along. So a final interview is like, Hey, is there anything I need to prepare for this? Anything I need to take into consideration? Like, like, no, it's really just a final sign off, you know, just let your personality shine. This, this job's already yours. You know, it's, it's yours to lose. Just, you know, just, you know, just have a good conversation. So I did my research, like the guy at LinkedIn saw that he was very high up in like a military intelligence role early in his career. He was an older gentleman. And so I was like, it's like, okay, cool. Um, so kind of had an idea of how he'd communicate. He got on the call and immediately he's like, Hey, I've never seen this job description before. And actually he's like, I don't agree with this. I don't think it's what we're looking for. I don't think it's what we want. So he still went through his questions and I had submitted portfolios and work samples and like a recorded presentation. So I was alluding back to previous conversations, assuming he had seen it. He's like, Oh, I never saw your portfolio. Oh yeah, no, I didn't know you did a presentation. I'm like, Whoa. Okay. So for me as a candidate, it sucked at the moment because I really wanted that job. A, they looked like they're doing really cool stuff. I'm like, if there's this lack of internal communication, like, do I really want to work for this place? But at the time it's like, at the time it's like, you, you don't know who I am or what I'm about. Or like, you haven't even seen the job post. He looked at the job post and he's like, yeah, I don't agree with this at all. He's like, he's like, yeah, no, I didn't know we were hiring for this. I'm just like, uh, I don't think that's a conversation for you and me. I think that's a conversation with you, like in your department heads. I don't, I don't know what to right. tell you. Right. Yeah. And that, that's a tough, that's a tough situation to be in as a candidate. Um, and I, a lot of my clients have been getting that, that talk from recruiter, the recruiter, like, Hey, you know, it's final stages. We're going to have you talk to the COO. This is just to like, a, a get to know you, you know, it's not a big deal. They get on the phone with him and then they're like, bam, bam, bam with hard hitting. If questions. you're a frog in a blender with a quarter, like those Google <laughs> crazy questions. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> that that but also just like it's not a chill interview they're like hey you know tell me about a time you know it's like very star format behavioral interview type questions uh, all the way through and so i say to all of my clients you still you got to be stay frosty on all your interviews even if it seems chill and especially if it isn't like end stages where the recruiters kind of set it up it's going to be chill that first, second, third, fourth round where you're having a good conversation and maybe the conversation is drifting into like, you know, personal stuff, you know, like, oh, would you just, you know, it just seems like you're kind of like friends talking. That's actually kind of a red flag. Yes, building rapport is important, like, like you said, but if you're drifting off and you're not able to start, you know, continue the conversation about how you have value that they need or you identifying what their pain points are, you're missing an opportunity to make that connection. Uh, cause that's ultimately the reason why you're there. Uh, especially these, you know, look, larger companies, you know, pre marquee venture backed startups, uh, they ultimately need to know that you're the best candidate because you can pass the interview, but not get the job. And that's what I mean by being aware of how the interview is going. If you're starting to like dr drift off into fluff, you want to be able to bring it back by using a good question to start catalyzing the interview, to bring up, you know, what the challenges are of the role and how you can solve them. Yeah, I think, I think that's a fantastic point. And again, it goes back to knowing what the communicators should look like with that interview. I know usually I can read it fairly well, but sometimes I can't. So they'll usually, they'll start off with, sometimes they'll ask me like, hey, do you want us to tell you about the job and the company first and go through the standard questions? Do you want to start off giving a narrative of your career and then we'll do any questions? And a lot of times I'll just ask them back, um, they'll start the question, hey, tell us about yourself. And I'll say, all right, I've got a 30, 60, 90 second answer that'll probably hit most of the follow-up questions you have. Or I can literally walk you through my entire career and it'll probably, you know, in three, four or five minutes max, hit, hit a lot of things that you're going to ask for follow-up questions. And then that leaves the rest of the time for us to like really dive into the details of the job and what the day-to-day -day looks like. And then, and then really take it a, a step further, like which route would you prefer to take? And um, a lot, of, I, I started asking that question because I noticed a lot of interviewers would ask me, me that question. Hey, how do you want to run this thing? What do you want the communicating cadence to look like? So if they didn't ask me that, then I'd leave with that question in terms of how do you want to approach this thing? We have an hour, we have a half hour block of time. And then sometimes like I'd look at my clock. I know, I don't know if that's a best practice or not, but I'd look at my clock and be like, Hey, you know, I realize, you know, I want to be cognizant of your time. Um, we have five minutes left. I think it's a fantastic conversation. I do have some time to go over if you do too. And sometimes like, yeah, you know, we can go over a bit. Let's keep it going. Or other times, yeah, I have a hard out. I'm like, all right, how do we use these last five minutes? Like, are there some little checkbox items we need to go through? Or, you know, how do you want to fill this space? Cause I want to make sure that you make your next appointment. 
Yeah. And as a candidate watching that clock and being able to know that you're still going to have some time to get your questions answered uh, is really important. And I've had that, you know, throughout my career interviewers, it's, you know, half hour interview, you know, at three o'clock and now it's three twenty seven. And you're like, okay, well, what questions, Any questions? Do you have? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah. we've got time for you to answer this one question halfway. So having a ranked yep. list of impactful questions that if you only had to ask, had time for one, that you're going to feel good about that question and the value that it's going to deliver to you is really important to that, have that prepared. And I've learned to know, know where you are in the interview process. So if it's an initial phone screen, don't start asking like deep in the weeds questions like, oh, what, you know, what, what are your data hygiene challenges? Or, you know, what is your marketing automation tool? And why'd you select this? And which one, if you could budget permitting, would you might don't ask that on the initial phone screen or sometimes yeah. I'll ask them like, Hey, I have, I'll group the questions. So like, Hey, I have just some logistics questions, time zone, what kind of laptop text, you know, text setup is it, you know, uh, if it's later on, you know, biweekly, monthly, whatever, like whatever questions, like as it pertains to just like the general job. But sometimes I'll ask them like, Hey, these questions that are more in the weeds in terms of like the day to day, like actually how to run the team, you know, what, what the like deeper marketing challenges look like. Should I save that for the next round of interviews and kind of like pace that or precede that conversation? They're like, Oh yeah. You know, for it, for this round, you know, let's just hit these types of items. And then I'll usually say like, Hey, definitely enjoyed the conversation. I think the conversation is moving in the right direction. I'd love to, I'd, I'd look forward to moving forward. And like, and I definitely have these questions queued up to take it a step further on the, on the, on the follow-up interviews and usually kind of end it somewhere around there. So uh, that being said, I know we're already kind of getting into the topic of this next question, but what are some common mistakes to avoid during virtual interviews? Um, not, not being concise enough, you know, going over, uh, too much on, on your answers, in my opinion, you know, just to touch on that because it cuts. I've, I've, gotten that, I've gotten that feedback a lot too. Let's tighten it up. Yeah. Yeah. T tighten it up is very important because it's not just about the interview and the time you have left to ask your question. It's one of the key pillars of executive presence is the ability to be concise. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole dissertation I have on that, but cultivating executive presence is important even in a contractor role or entrepreneurial role, but usually in corporate America, take two people, same skill set, same role, same level of experience. One gets promoted, one doesn't. Why? Most commonly, it's because they have executive presence where the other person doesn't. Uh, and so one of the main pillars is being concise. Uh, and then second on preparation is doing research. You touched on this earlier, but I love to have my clients looking up the entire panel interview panel on linkedin look at their entire career history and then I've think about that. Like, like hey we have the same alma mater they're like oh no kidding you're like all right i won this guy yeah yep, not only that yeah. not only commonalities but also just surmising how they might think what kind of questions they're mm -hmm. going to ask and what they want to hear you know like i was helping a client recently she was going for a high level hr role and she was interviewing uh, doing well, made it to the final rounds. Like, hey, now you're going to talk to the chief revenue officer and the chief people officer. Both of them came from Amazon at one point in their careers. So it's kind of like, okay, th are they going to think in that structured leadership principle sort of way? Um, and you know, and like, what are they looking for? This is a SaaS cloud computing company that was newly public. And it's like, they've already done it. Now this smaller company has hired them to help them build everything out and then take them to the big time. And so they want big macro strategic execution ability and ability to survive at that level and not just tactical uh, as one example. So you can kind of infer and glean that when you look at someone's LinkedIn history. And that's a really key part of the preparation because it's tailoring and calibrating to them as a person and what they're looking for. And going back, we were talking about it previously in the conversation, um, the sales and marketing avatars in terms of creating avatars for who your interviewers are. So is it someone around my age who's maybe more of a West Coast tech type bro? Is it like a fintech bro from New York? Is it someone who's older, maybe a baby boomer type person or like, if I don't see you work and how do I know you're working type or... I've noticed for a lot of times um, when I've interviewed with like older females, scroll down on LinkedIn and look at what their volunteer activities are. A lot of times they have passion products or things that are near and dear to them. Maybe maybe don't address it directly, but try to like weave that stuff in. Um, a lot of large companies I've worked for recently, they're really into like the DEI, like the diversity, equity, and inclusion type initiatives. They're really into like ESG, environmental social governance. So wherever you stand personally on that or not, it doesn't matter if you want the job. Like if these things are near and dear to them, like maybe kind of may not make it a primary conversational thread, but maybe a secondary or tertiary one to kind of weave in. So I've, I've done things like that too. Um, but really like you can take a look at someone's LinkedIn profile and get a pretty good idea of who they are. Just 
in right. terms of marketing and sales. These are the things they thought they were important to put out there publicly. So it might be important to them. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you see people's pedigree and just like, wow, you went to here, this school, and then you went to this company, you bounced around in such an interesting way. And it's almost like, you know, a good, sometimes a good signal, like, well, they're at this company uh, and they seemingly like they have the choice. They could go anywhere. Why did you choose here? And that's sometimes a question I like to ask them directly. It's like, oh, well, hey, a good one. you know, you've had like a very interesting career trajectory and you chose to come here. You could go anywhere. What, what, what about this place? did you see that made you so excited to join? I've asked so. that one too, in terms of, Hey, any questions for us? Like, yeah. How do you like working here? You know, like what, what's been your personal experience, you know? And, yeah. uh, and a lot of times you'll see their face light, like, Oh yeah. Like no one really asked that. Like I actually do like working here. They, they'll be candid too. Like, Hey, I wasn't too sure at first. I kind of needed a job. You know, there were some departmental challenges, but I came in, we worked through the, the roadblocks really quickly. And now we're in a place where our, and that, that I've noticed, like you can see on the expression of their face, they'll give you a candid answer. And a lot of times I get a lot more insight from that question too, rather than, because I know for my answers as a candidate, like, tell us about a time when you had to deal with a difficult employee. Like, okay, I, I, I practiced that answer so many times that I have it already queued up. And I know how to tell different versions of that stories to different people or, or whatever, based on time constraints, based on what's important to them. So, um, so when it's a question that they're, they're not expecting or they have a canned answer to, it's like, oh, wow, like no one's really asked me that before. Like, huh, you know, let me, let me think about that. Yeah. Um, which leads to our next question. Um, have you observed any common challenges faced by remote workers or just, again, workers in general? And how candidates address them proactively? <clears throat> common challenges during the interview process? I'd or, say the the overall process. I know, I know that there's bottle. It's again, I use the marketing and sales at, and analogy. There's different stages across the funnel, but um, yeah. like yeah, some common hangups that maybe remote first workers may may encounter. Got it. I mean, look, the common hangups just in general now are there is the power, quote unquote, the power on from a macro balance has shifted back into employers' hands from employees' hands in that 2021 2022 time frame. Um, so companies are taking much longer in interview cycles to make a decision. It's like, it's getting crazy. I mean, it's getting up to eight and 10 sometimes of rounds of interviews before an offer is made, uh, which is kind of crazy. The other thing is the delays. Like, hey, this position's open. You come in for round one, round two, pause. Mm -hmm. Month later, why don't you come in for round three? You know, and companies are debating headcount constantly. And especially this time of year, you know, yeah, it's, it's March 11th, 2024. So, you know, most companies with their fiscal year being on the calendar year, you know, they've wrapped up Q1 earnings will get reported here pretty soon for a lot of the Fortune 500 that falls on that cadence. And like they're trying to forecast and figure out what do we have a budget for uh, headcount wise going forward for the rest of the year. So they're sometimes reticent to commit. Now, once they figure it out, we'll probably see hiring open up a bit more in the next few months. Um, but still, it's going to be a long interview cycle for most people. And so getting multiple threads going, multiple interview processes, it's working a full-time job just to interview to find one. Uh, so that's another It topic. is. I always say looking for a job is a full-time job and you should treat it as such. If not, like I think long gone are the days where you can just passively be out there. Now I, I do, I do do passive job searches. Let's say you're at a company and you realize, okay, this, this isn't really going anywhere. They're not scaling. Like you kind of get whiff and maybe layoffs coming. Yeah. Then you can do the passive thing because you don't necessarily have a, a finite time crunch. But for me, and I, I don't know if what your clients are like, but a lot of times when I'm actively on a job search, it's because I currently don't have a job and I have expenses and I don't have income. And that's not a fun place to be in. So it's like, like I tell these interviewers, like, Hey, it's moving along. Let's, let, let's get it going. There's some synergy yeah. here. Let's, we, we got chemistry. You know, I can do the job. I know that you, you need this filled. What are we waiting for? Let's, I don't necessarily say it that way. Sometimes I do, but not exactly. That's kind of the mentality I have in terms of like, let's, let's move it along. You know, let's, let's, let's get it done. You guys have a need yeah. and I can, I can fix it. For sure. And I think also it's important to have multiple irons in the fire. So many of my clients have gone through the, they make it through the final rounds or just very close to the end. And they're like, you know, we didn't go with you. You it was so close. You're so good. We just, we chose somebody who has direct industry experience, whatever, you know, there's little out of control things. So it's like, well, that was on my resume right when we started this, you saw yeah, that. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and I researched you, you didn't research me. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, just, just having multiple irons in the fire so that you can weather the, the, the disappointment and heartbreak of like making it to the end of a process. And then they say no, 
but it wasn't for any particular reason. Granted, that is kind of a legal environment. Companies are usually are pretty cagey about why, but sometimes you can really tell that yeah, they yeah. genuinely meant like you were awesome. We just, someone was a little better. I've had that happen before too, like around Christmas time. All indications was getting to the offer stage. I think that Saturday before Christmas got two rejections. One of them was, um, it was like a very heavily involved DEI company. So uh, it was something like, well, I, I made the comment. So don't do this if it's a DEI company. But they said like, what are your pronouns? And like, I'm a broad shouldered guy with a beard. So someone previously on the call made the, the like, like, oh, Jaron, we thought that was a girl's name. Like it, it could be a girl's name. It could be a boy's name. It could be an it name. Like, I, I don't really care. Like, you know, just call me whatever you want. You know, I thought I was saying that in good spirit. I got, a, I, got a, I got a message back from the recruiter. Like they're ready to make you an offer. They were highly offended when they said you can call, they can call you it. I'm like, but they call, they, they said I had a girl name. So like, I was just kind of joking to show I'm not offended by it. That doesn't matter. That was a wrong approach. So oh, that, no. that, that offer gone. And then the other one, um, the hiring manager was actually, this will happen sometimes too. Like the hiring manager, uh, like, Hey, I have your personal number. And like, they'll just text you and kind of like walk you through it. So, uh, even after the, even after the fact, got like the HR, all indications I was getting an offer because the hiring manager told me, told me that much, um, all indications from her that I was going to get the offer. HR sends me a standard, like, Hey, thanks. But you know, like, or something like, wait, we don't have budget or we didn't get budget approved or something. And then the hiring manager reached back, back out. She's like, Hey, she's like, I'm really quite irked at this. She's like, I was looking forward to bring you on. I was ready to have you start right in the new year. And this is really impacting my team. She's like, if anything changes at all, I will definitely let you know. She's like, I still want to work with you. She's like, this one is out of my hands. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you don't get the, the peeled back inside view of what's going on behind the scenes, but sometimes they will reveal it to you. It's like, it wasn't me. And I, I know there's legal ramifications for why they don't often do that. But for me as a candidate, it's like, it wasn't me. Like I did everything right. So, and I've, I've been on the, I've been on the other side of the coin too, where I want to get, I want to outsource something or I want to bring on a freelancer or like a process improvement consultant. We're ready to go. And I'm, I'm starting to mentally map out how this is going to positively impact my team. Then accounting comes back like, yeah, no, no go. Like we actually need to cut your budget. Like, what are you doing? We're producing like, we're generating all the revenue for the company. Why would you cut my budget? And like sometimes as a hiring manager, it's just out of your hands. Yeah, that's tough. I had a candidate recently go through that, make it through a lot of rounds of interviews, and then company reported earnings and announced a restructuring. And so they're like, yeah, already they're laying off. They're not going to increase headcount. Yeah, that sucks. Correct. It's not even that they're necessarily laying off. It's mm -hmm. that, I mean, yes, obviously the layoff would stop everything, but just the restructuring, it causes uncertainty. You know, mm -hmm. their former, you know, chief, whatever that org is now going to report to somebody else. So like, what does that person want? What is that person's philosophy on and strategy? So they got to sit around and wait for that to be defined. And that's always a deal killer usually for a candidate. It's really, it's painful. Oh, it it, it is disheartening sometimes. And like the, the job searches can be quite stressful. So um, I know I sent you over some pre-recording questions. There's a couple left. I'm looking at these now. I think a lot of them are redundant. I think the conversation naturally covered a lot of this. So, um, so at this point, I, I think I'll just ask you, you know, what I ask my, in my interviews, is there anything we failed to cover that you think would be important to cover for the sake of this conversation and my audience? <laughs> for sure. It's good. I mean, yeah. look, it's when it comes to job offer negotiation, just know that the negotiation starts on the first phone call when the recruiter asks, what are your salary expectations? Um, and this is something that catches a lot of people off guard. A lot of conventional knowledge and wisdom out there says to just state a range and it's not bad to do, but it's kind of like buying a car and you walk onto a lot. What's the first question they ask? Yeah. What's your budget? Yeah. Or they, no, budget? They'll ask, what do you want your monthly payment to be? I was like, don't exactly. worry about monthly payment. Let's assume I have it in cash. What's the cost of the car? And if they can't exactly. give me that cost, it's like, Hey, assume that I'm here with an endless supply of cash. What, how many dollars do I need to give you to buy this car? What do you want your monthly payment? It's like, I've worked in finance. I know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. like, what's the, the sticker four price? Box. It's all about yield. The spread four boxes. Premium. Yep. And yield spread premium interest rate. Anyway. So it's kind of the same situation with a job and they ask you, what are your salary expectations? But do they have bonuses? Is there equity involved? You don't know what uh, other elements of compensation there are. Also, you don't understand the full scope of the role yet. You know, is the role even properly leveled? You know, say we're looking for a, you know, digital marketer. Well, after you look at it, like the campaigns that you're running, the size of company, this DTC brand, whatever, it could be a senior or sometimes like I should be. I see that role. a lot in job <laughs> postings, like three years experience. Like now nah, this is a higher level manager type role. Or right. um, I know a question I'll ask sometimes. It's nice when they have a range posted. 
So I've, I've been told by people like, don't ever talk about what you made before. But if it's, if I want the higher end of the range and they're like just shy of what I was making before, they're like, Hey, by the way, I made this in my previous employer, very well-known worldwide company to where like, like they don't hire idiots to work for this company. So like, this is what these guys paid me. I understand you might not be there, but like to, to move forward, I need to be at the higher end of this range you posted. Or I'll ask them like, what does your compensation philosophy look like? That's exactly what I was going to say. That's what I have my clients do is. So we turn it around and they say, I'm so glad we're talking about this, but I'm curious, what is your company's compensation philosophy for this role? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause sometimes like, like you said, some of the tech companies, they'll give like, they'll have some, like some good equity options or good benefits or mm -hmm. bonuses or like, yeah, you know, like the, maybe the posted salary band is a little lower, but they have a 401k match, like up to 6% or something. Then I just mentally factor that in too. Or if they bring it back to me, then I'll say, uh, I'll say something along the lines of like, hey, you know, I know salary is an important package and a compensation philosophy, but look, I, overall, I look at the entire compensation package um, and, and factor in things that a lot of other candidates might not. So like, like, it's definitely not a deal breaker if we can't agree on just salary alone, but there's other areas that we can negotiate too. For sure. And also being cognizant of, you know, the stage of your career, what you're looking for next. Is this a learn versus earn job? Uh, oh, that's goodness. another thing. Because sometimes, you know, we all start out, we got to learn, right? So learning those premium skill sets, you may get an opportunity at a really great marquee brand name company, or maybe you want to work for Alex Hermosi, right? He, had, he worked for a certain entrepreneur. That's going to carry and pay dividends for you the rest of your career. Even if it doesn't pay a ton now, it may be worth to make that trade off at this juncture in your career. But so having that lens is really important uh, to help shape your negotiation strategy. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic point. I actually interviewed with uh, Alex Hormozzi years ago, back when wow. he was launching uh, Gym Launch Secrets. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting one. It was a group interview to where all of the candidates were put together in a group. And at the time, I was like, oh, I nailed it. But I think I screwed. I didn't get the job. So I think I screwed up. The, I commanded all the attention of the room. And it became more about me leading the conversation and bringing the other pool of candidates onto my side rather than addressing the actual need of the company and leading the conversation in that direction. At the time, like, oh, I killed it. Like, like all of the other candidates like saw me as their leader. And he's like, yeah, no, dude. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but way back in the day when they started the mustaches. But cool company. I think he's, he's a fantastic entrepreneur. And I, I still oh, my God, yeah. Stuff. I think he's great. Yeah. All right. So at this point, um, I, I know we can probably talk about this forever, but um, anything else, guys, that maybe we failed to cover, uh, feel free to reach out to me at Jaron Scott. I can put you in touch with Aaron or Aaron, where, where can people find you? Uh, do you have anything to sell, anything to pitch? Um, I'm definitely interested too in, in picking your brain more on this stuff. Um, on the job search side, I'm sure I could always do better too, but I've noticed one thing I haven't done in my career is actually have a career coach in terms mm -hmm. of like, why am I looking for this job now? And where do I want to be in this amount of time? And how am I positioning myself today to get to where I want to be in the longer term? During my job search, I watched a ton of YouTube, um, you know, executive coaches, career coaches, recruiters, all that stuff. And a lot of them were selling those kinds of services. I, I pay I pay a lot of money for coaching personally. I think I'm worth it. Uh, I think that I'm my own best investment. And uh, I've noticed that I haven't actually Con considered a career coach in the past. So um, if yeah. that's something you do or, you know, what, what, how can you help people? Where do they find you and what's the next steps for them? For sure. I mean, you know, as an executive coach, we're all the CEO of our lives. I help people manage the most difficult conversations of their lives and career. So whether it's career coaching or things in your personal life, the things that I address. And I have that also that niche specialty of salary negotiation as well. And so people can find me at resparkcoaching.com or at Aaron Tweet on all platforms, A-A-R-O-N-T-H-W-E-A-T-T. -T. And the best way to work with me is to have a conversation. I'll also be launching my group program in April called the Audacious Ask Academy. And oh, cool. it's not just about the Audacious Ask and your salary. It's about the Audacious Ask for that promotion or that exposure to another department to learn more premium skill sets to move up in your career. Because really managing a career conversation is usually a campaign and it takes clarity. So we mentioned, you know, why haven't you hired a career coach? You know, it's sometimes clarity. Uh, seeking clarity is the most important thing. Didn't even One, didn't know they existed and two, didn't understand the value. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's important. So getting clear on what you want is important. But then what are the strategies and tactics and conversations and the, for the people that you'll need to influence to help you get there? Uh, that come after it are really important to ascertain as well. And that's what I help with is kind of that end to end process of managing conversations for you to get to your next step. 
Yeah, and guys, so yeah, definitely, definitely hit up Aaron. Um, Aaron, pass me your information. Well, we'll throw it in the description. Um, so people can find you. And same thing I mentioned. I've done. I've hired coaches for all sorts of stuff in my life. Um, I actually did it on my own years ago. I think I, I thought that six figures was a very high dollar amount, or that it was out of reach for me until I started meeting other people around me that did that. And then I just made up my mind that like, this is what my next job is going to pay me and actually found it very quickly and effectively doubled my salary from like immediately in the course of one phone call. Hey, we want to offer you this. I'm like, whoa. Whereas prior, I thought that, well, at this level of my career at this stage, I don't deserve this or whatever that internal thought was. I probably could have, again, done better had I known a lot of these things we discussed today early in my career, yeah. or I'm now considering getting a career coach and I'm probably mid moving into the more senior level of my career if I had one out the gate. And, and I'm not talking about like college career counselors. A lot of them don't know what they're talking about because uh, they you know, have tenure. They haven't really been in the workforce for Lord knows how long or actually yeah. on the job market. So um, I always say, guys, at the end of the day, like you are your own best investment definitely don't cheap out on yourself like if you can potentially get 10 20 30 50k or in my case i, I literally doubled uh to hit to get my first six figure job i almost doubled my salary in that round of of jobs like okay if i could have had someone holding my hand along the way and done that much sooner in my career where could i be now so a lot of times the investment yourself um, it is an upfront investment, but it, it will pay for itself very very quickly and then also before we go i promised that i would save my pitch for the end for those looking to build lives worth living and loving and leveling up in all areas of love, love and life, love and life, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I haven't done the pitch in a while. Um, we have the Men of Now community, so that's for just people looking to level up. Um, feel free to reach out to me directly for more information on that or that link down below. It's menofnow.us. Um, it is a small but mighty and quickly growing group. We actually just migrated to a new platform today at time of posting, so we have a lot of new stuff coming in. Uh, we have a handful of coaches in there, content creators, guys in all areas of their life, uh, dating, fitness, finances, lifestyle design, fashion, any of that stuff. It's really, we're trying to get guys in there that really take themselves seriously and guys that want to help other people. So um, Aaron, you're always welcome. I think we have a, we're recording this today. We have a weekly call tomorrow. So at the time of posting this guys, we will have a weekly call within minutes of this ending. So if you are interested, we're offering a free trial for seven days. Uh, you'll get in on our weekly call, check out the new platform, premium posts, meet the guys in there. And then, uh, you know, if something becomes of it, great. We'd love to have you on board. If not, you know, might not be the best fit We're fitting in with the, the job search type terminology. So if you're interested in that um, and ju jumping on our next weekly call, reach out to me directly, uh, Instagram at Jaron Scott, and I will get you set up for that. And, you know, we'd, Love to see you in there and uh, give you a, a preview or a sample of what we're all about. So that being said, Aaron, uh, do you have anything else for this fine audience? Or if not, I shall bring it on home. Always advocate for yourself in every realm of life. I think that's fantastic. Well, there you go. There you have it, guys and gals. I want to thank you all for stopping on by. And until next time, I shall bid you all farewell.